So to start this presentation, I brought you a picture, the picture with what we woke up on March 5th this year. And when I saw this picture, I was really, really afraid because you can see here the nuclear power plant in the UK has been hit by a Russian missile. So I'm now going to talk about all the issues with nuclear power plants that we have in Ukraine and how to legally um, work with these issues. To start, Russia, eh, sorry, Ukraine is very, very invested in nuclear energy. As you can see, there are five major nuclear facilities. One, of course, the most famous, one of the most famous nuclear facilities, Chernobyl, the ruin that had an accident in 1986. Um, and also the Zaporizhia power plant in the southeast, where we saw the strike almost three, three months ago. So what has, what has happened with nuclear power plants in Ukraine so far? So on the first day of the war on February 24, the Russian forces um, seized control of the Chernobyl ruin. As you saw on the map, Chernobyl is quite in the north, so directly in the Belarusian border. So it was the Russian troops very, very quickly at the ruin and they occupied the power plant until the end of March um, when the Russian troops started to focus more on the eastern part of the country. In that eastern part of the country, as you might saw, is the Saproshia nuclear power plant, which was hit on March 4th of this year. And as you can see here on the picture, you see the yellow um, circle shows the six um, reactors of this power plant, which is the biggest nuclear power plant in Europe. And the red circle shows where the missile from Russia hit, which is only 300 meters away from the closest reactor. Given the position of Russian missiles, it was very, very, very lucky that no reactor was hit, because if a reactor had been hit, um, this would have been a huge catastrophe for the entirety of Europe. Until today, this power plant is under Russian occupation and the International Atomic Energy Agency is not allowed to visit this site. So after we've talked about the facts, let's talk about the legal framework that is applicable. I'm going to focus on two parts of international law, first nuclear law and second on international humanitarian law. First, what is nuclear law? We're now in this meeting about 50 people and I don't think that anybody of you ever really worked with nuclear law, even though it's a part of public international law. And since nobody really talks about nuclear law, the IAEA organized a conference a month ago in Vienna about the global debate and the role of nuclear law, which I intended. And during that um, conference, the director general also mentioned the importance to spread the knowledge of nuclear law within the academic society. So. You can see this as a contribution to the mission of, of the IAEA. So the nuclear law consists of four pillars. There is safety, security, safeguards, and civil liability for nuclear damages. When I started working in nuclear law, I couldn't really see the differences because what's the difference between safety and security, especially in German, there is no differentiation between these words unlike in English. Also safeguards. What's the difference between safety and safeguards? It's kind of like, sounds like the same, but I'm going to explain it. First, with safety, we mean to keep the public safe from the influence of nuclear material and its radiological effects. So safety, the safety pillar tries to prevent any accidents and to mitigate the exposure of radiation to the public um, as best as possible while security um, focuses on the power plant in itself and tries to protect the nuclear power plant from external influences. So the safety tries to protect the public from the influences of um, the power plant, while the security is um, the other side of the coin, which tries to protect the power plant from the outside. So, but you can see they're very closely interrelated because why is the security important? Because once there is a security violation, radiological material can be um, liberated and therefore the public could be object of, uh, of radiation, which is actually the aim of safety. So they're very, very closely interrelated. The, the third pillar is safeguards. Safeguards may be one of the most important aspects of international law, uh, of nuclear law. Um, 
with safeguards, the entire non-proliferation system of um, nuclear weapons is guaranteed. So the non-proliferation treaty of 1970 differentiates between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. While the nuclear weapon states are allowed to have nuclear weapons, the non-nuclear weapon states are not allowed to have them. And in order to keep sure that the um, non-nuclear weapon states remain non-nuclear weapon states, each um, there is a safeguard system in place which tries to control all nuclear facilities in the country to keep sure that no nuclear weapons are acquired by a non-nuclear weapon state. Finally, there is the civil liability for nuclear damages, which um, is a special civil liability regime because, for example, after the Fukushima Daiichi accident 11 years ago, there were damages in the order of magnitude of $100 billion. Since these are enormous numbers, there is a separate um, regime of civil liability um, in place to, to target these special problems with these high, high numbers. Then within the nuclear law framework, there are mainly three important actors. The most important actor is the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, um, located in Vienna. They are within the UN family and are sometimes called the UN's watchdog for atom, uh, nuclear purposes. But also in Europe, Eurotom, one of the original um, European communities, which is still a separate community to the European Union, is invested in nuclear law as well. And finally, the OECD, uh, which has an own court of which Professor van Bogdandi was part of until a couple of years ago. On the other hand, there's the international humanitarian law, which most of you uh, will know is mainly governed by um, the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and the additional protocols of 1977, which were created under the auspices of the International Committee of the Red Cross. So how does now this legal framework apply to the situation that we have or had in the last couple of months in Ukraine? First, as I said, safety and security are two pillars that are closely um, interrelated. Um, let's first talk about them. The IAEA developed seven pillars that are crucial in ensuring nuclear safety and security. They're developed on the one hand from hard law, there's the Convention on Nuclear Safety, there's a Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material, but also from soft law because the IAEA has the mandate to create handbooks and guidebooks um, for the member states in order to guarantee nuclear safety and security. The first pillar is the physical integrity of facilities, which is maybe the most obvious pillar because once the physical, the physical integrity of a facility isn't ensured, there's the risk of the um, exposure of radiological material, and therefore it's a hazard for the public. And by the strike of the Sapo Rishia uh, power plant, this pillar was um, violated. Second, all safety and security systems must be fully functional all the time because there are several systems. If a reactor gets too hot, it's getting shut down. Um, all these things, also security guards, of course, are important. The functioning cameras in the um, facilities are important. And due to the occupation, this wasn't insured in Chernobyl and is still not insured in um, the Saporizhia power plant. Thirdly, the staff needs to operate free from pressure. Maybe one could think that this is not such an important pillar, but one needs to keep in mind that the Chernobyl power plant was mainly um, had this, its, in, its accident due to human error because the um, operating staff was under huge pressure at this time, which finally caused the accident that happened. Firstly, the off-power supply must always be secured. You can imagine that the operation of a nuclear power plant requires a lot of energy because you have the cooling systems, you have control systems. Normally, um, the power plant creates this energy itself because, of course, if it wouldn't be able to sustain itself, then it wouldn't be a power plant. So, um, but there are occasions where a power plant needs to be shut off. If there are some danger issues like a war raging in, near it, the reactors are shut down and thus they're not producing any more energy. But the cooling, of course, must go on. So you need a secure offsite power um, supply, which also was the reason for the Fukushima Daiichi accident. 
because the reactors got too hot and they couldn't cool it with external energy because all the supply and grid was destroyed by the uh, tsunami back then. Similarly, in both Chernobyl and Saporizhia, the connecting power grid was partially destroyed by the Russian attacks and therefore the external power supply was in danger. There are still diesel generators in cases of emergency to still keep it running, but of course this is only for a short period of time possible. Also, the logistical supply chains need to be uninterrupted all the time, which of course doesn't happen when half of the country is occupied by um, foreign armed forces. Sixthly, the often on-site radiation monitoring system must be effectively working because the first hint that something is not working properly is if, there are any, if there's any kind of radiation measured above a certain threshold. When the Russian forces withdrew from Chernobyl, they stole a lot of um, measuring equipment, which, was a, which is still today a problem for the radiation measurings in Chernobyl. And finally, the communication with the regulating authority needs to be working um, because the main operation is done at the power plant, uh, power plant site itself, but also some of it is done by the regulator authority, so the communication must work all the time. But the Saporizhia power plant is partially seized by Rosatom, the Russian um, atomic energy agency, so there's no properly working communication between the Saporizhia power plant and the um, Ukrainian regulators. Next, let's talk about the safeguards. As I already said, we have the non-proliferation treaty with, with uh, which discriminates between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states um, in order to ensure this safeguard system each country each non-nuclear weapon states has a comprehensive safeguards agreement with the iaea so the, in this agreement it is um, regulated how many inspectors from the iaea can come to the power side how often they can come which kind of other um instruments are implemented, such as cameras. And one part of this is a data transfer. There are a lot of cameras in each nuclear power plant, and this data transfer still works to Vienna. So there's inspectors sitting in Vienna at the IAEA's headquarters, and they're still able to control what's happening there. But an essential part is the visit in person from inspectors. And while after the Russians withdrew from Chernobyl, the IAE inspectors could um, get on site, the uh, Tsaporizhia power plant is still not possible to access for IAEA um, inspectors. But one must also say, what's the purpose of the safeguard system? It's to um, stop the diversion of nuclear material for weapon purposes for at non-nuclear weapon states. But who's the occupier? It's Russia, and Russia is a nuclear weapon state. So it's not that big of a danger as it could be if the, um, the, the occupier was a non-nuclear weapon state. Finally, the, um, the civil liability for nuclear damages. There are two big conventions um, existing which um, establish a special system of civil liability one for the OECD states, which is called the Paris Convention, and the other is for other IAEA states is the Vienna Convention, of which Ukraine is part of. There are some basic rules in this system. The first is that the operator is exclusively responsible. So if there is a nuclear damage, you can sue any supplier, any individual, the state, the regulating authority, you can always only um, sue the operator to focus all legal claims to just one um, party. Also, there are some minimums of damages that needs to be guaranteed, um, either by um, state funds or by insurances. And lastly, um, for those who attended the, the masterclass, it was a kind of topic as well. And um, we want to prevent forum shopping to have um, no contradictory um, decisions. So the competence, the jurisdiction competence is exclusive at one single court. So this system helps both um, every stakeholder which is involved in operating a nuclear power plant, but also the um, victim to, to ensure that they're compensated for damages without too much complexities. 
However, due to um, Article 4, Paragraph 3 of the Vienna Convention, this entire system, which is so important for, for nuclear damages, um, does not apply if the damage is caused by a uh, during an armed conflict. So this entire system wouldn't apply if the um, Seposhia power plant had been strike, uh, stro stroke directly. So as you saw, all four pillars of nuclear law are highly inflicted within the, um, the conflict. So now let's move on to the international humanitarian law. While the Geneva Conventions in 1949 couldn't address nuclear power plants because in 1949, no nuclear power plants ex existed, they were addressed in the additional protocol one of 1977. And they have a special kind of protection um, which is provided by article 56 of AP1. It states that a nuclear power plant shall not be made the object of attack if such an attack may cause the release of dangerous forces. Since almost any nuclear power plant can release um, dangerous forces if it is hit, even today, Chernobyl, 26 years after the accident, this is for a, a nuclear power plant always the case. So there's this kind of special protection. However, and this is the big if, Article 56 has a second paragraph, which states that this special protection ceases if it provides electric power in regular, significant, and direct support of military operations. So what does it mean? What is regular, significant, and direct support? Within a power grid, you cannot differentiate what's the source of um, the electron that's coming out of your grid. So since electrical power, since nuclear power covers about 20% of the Ukraine's um, energy supply, 20% of all the uh, electric energy that the military uses is from a nuclear power plant. So is it directly as significant as direct support? I would say yes. So even though there's a special protection, a nuclear power plant could be object of an armed attack within international humanitarian law. So to give you a conclusion, the international legal framework isn't really prepared for war in nuclear states because when all these conventions were drafted, it was thought impossible that there is a conventional war in a nuclear state, of course, there was the fear of a third world war between the big superpowers, but this would have been a nuclear war. But a conventional war within um, nuclear states wasn't deemed um, possible. And we also saw that all pairs of nuclear law are challenged and maybe the most shocking um, conclusion that MPPs can theoretically be object of armed attacks. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask.